St. Mary's Parish Church in beautiful Mount Angel, Oregon, has the awesome privilege to invite from the Benedictine Hilltop community at Mount Angel Abbey, Abbot Jeremy Driscoll. Abbot Jeremy will be sharing tonight on his experiences of the Eucharist, especially from the perspective of the Holy Mass. Abbot Jeremy is the 12th Abbot of Mount Angel Abbey, elected by the community in March of 2016. He made his first profession in the community on September the 8th, 1974, and was ordained a priest in 1981. During his years in the community, Father Jeremy has taught theology at Mount Angel Seminary and at the seminary in Rome. As abbot, he continues to teach classes at Mount Angel. As abbot, he continues to serve on various Vatican commissions, most recently the Commission for the Retranslation of the English Mass. He conducts conferences and retreats throughout the United States and beyond, and continues to write and publish. On behalf of Father Ralph and the parish team here at St. Mary's in Mount Angel, we welcome you here tonight to listen to Abbot Jeremy share from his wealth of experience on the Holy Eucharist. Ladies and gentlemen, Abbot Jeremy Driscoll. So thank you, Father Ralph, and thanks to all of you for this invitation to be with you in your parish and to talk about holy things. Uh, I'm glad that uh, Father Ralph moved the ambo here. Uh, if it were where it normally is, you might think uh, it's going to be a very long homily, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes, I'm invited uh, to give you a substantial conference to help us think together about what we do in this space, especially the celebration of Mass in this space. This is the year in, in, the, in our country uh, of a Eucharistic revival where the church in every part of the, of the country is making an effort to understand the Mass more deeply. And it ought to be something that can be um, something that we can continually grow in. I, I hope to give you some, some clues tonight that will help you to see, oh yes, that's what it means doing what we do every Sunday when we're here. But also a way in which every time we come to Mass, I think the mystery can, can deepen more and more for us. And so that's my hope of, of uh, what I can do uh, in the short, short hour that we have to be together. Uh, some years ago, I, I wrote a book that had the title, What Happens at Mass? I know that some of you know that book. And I, I, can, I can share with you the joy that I've had in reactions to it, that it seems to, it seems to help people. i tell you, the, the voice in which I wrote that uh, book, uh, it was that it ought to be possible for any serious Catholic that makes the effort to understand the Mass at great depth. God would not have set things up in such a way that you have to be a trained theologian to understand him. You might have to be a trained theologian to write the book, but not to understand it. And not, uh, you don't need to be a trained theologian to understand the Mass at depth. Uh, but you need to make an effort. And tonight's being together can be that effort. The title, What Happens at Mass, is not a question, it's a statement. I want to talk about what happens at Mass. And to put it briefly, at Mass, God speaks, God speaks, and God acts to save us. God acts to save us. Mass begins you can, you can meditate on this. Mass begins when you're at home getting ready to come here. While you're at home getting ready to come here, others are coming too from all over. And everyone arrives from a different place in life and with a different story behind them. The story of faith. How is it that you believe? How is it that I believe? We all believe because of God's action in our lives, bringing us to faith 
through others. We've all received our faith from somebody else. And slowly but surely, faith gets us all together in the church and this assembly, where the assembly is poised for mass. I like to meditate on this, and, and you could do the same. Watch people coming. Watch yourself come. That's the church gathering. That's God's grace at work in your lives. And he brings us all together so that he can speak, as I said, so that he can speak to us and so that he can act to save us. I think it can be useful if I talk about four parts of the Mass that you're familiar with, but to draw your attention to and to watch the progression from one of these parts to the other. After we have gathered, after we're all here, after the church is assembled, uh, the community begins to sing and the procession with ministers comes down the aisle. The priest at the back, perhaps with a deacon, perhaps with other ministers, coming and kissing the altar, carrying the book in procession. Uh, this, is a, this is the community welcoming and, and seeing, if you will, seeing, oh, Christ is present here. Christ is present in his priest. Christ is present at the head of the assembly in his priest. But Christ is, is present in the whole assembly because this, this action of the Mass is going to make the church, it's going to make us, the church, become his body in the world. Anyway, the first of four, here, here's the four parts of the Mass I want to talk about. I want to talk about, about first, the liturgy of the word. Secondly, the bringing of gifts of bread and wine to the hands of the priest and placing them on the altar. Third, the transformation of the gifts in the course of the Eucharistic prayer. And fourth, our communion in the gifts, our reception of communion. This is a dynamic flow and movement that has a, a deep kind of sense to it. And one that you, you know these four parts of the Mass. I want to think about them more deeply with you in a couple of moves. The, the liturgy of the word, it always begins on a Sunday Mass with a reading from the Old Testament. This is followed by a responsorial psalm, and then there's a reading from a letter, of the, uh, a, a brief a passage from the letter, usually from the letter of Paul, the apostle, but the other apost apostolic letters are also read, and then the gospel. Um, the Old Testament reading is read by us Christians the old Jewish scriptures that were written before Christ came, they're read by us Christians in our assemblies because we believe <clears throat> that all of those texts ultimately speak of Christ. They foreshadow Christ. They are the preparation for his story. In a sense, <clears throat> one would need and to know the whole, and, and, and we as Catholics, we have a sense, we know kind of the broad whole story of the Old Testament. Um, You've heard of the Exodus, they come out of Egypt, they wander around in the desert. You've heard of the Messiah, you've heard of King David, you've heard of the prophets. This is, this is several millennia of history. And it's God's history. It's God's working to form a people, the nation Israel, and to raise up within the nation Israel a Messiah who is nothing less than God's own Son come to us in the flesh. So we need, this is why we read from the Old Testament. We don't read the whole Old Testament, but one part symbolically is meant to represent the whole. But let me tell you something important about whether it's the Old Testament or the Apostle or the Gospel that's read. The Church believes that when the Scripture is read <clears throat> in the believing assembly, it's not just somebody I don't know how to put it. It's not just somebody reading something. We say the word of the Lord. It's God speaking through human language. And God's word has a power to it. God's word is ultimately crafted 
by the Holy Spirit. We say it in the creed. He spoke through the prophets, meaning he spoke through all the Old Testament. God's word is crafted by the Holy Spirit. And God's word, because it is God's word, never grows old. So every time a scriptural passage is read in the church, when we are gathered in faith, <clears throat> what's read there becomes the very event of this liturgy. God is doing in your minds and hearts what the word says. <clears throat> and the priest, preacher, is supposed to help you see that. But <clears throat> you can see it without the preaching. Because, <clears throat> to quote the Apostle John, you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You all have received the Holy Spirit for the understanding of the Word of God. So come disposed and ready for that. <clears throat> I tell my students, where in the seminary, you know, we, ha we have to study the Bible so that we can preach it and open it up and, and help people to, to work through it. But um, reading the Bible by yourself and trying to figure out what the heck it means is not the main thing. I say that the, the, the biblical text studied is like the notes of a musical score. Uh, and if you're gonna, if you're gonna play a masterpiece of music, you have to study the score in advance. But the notes on the page are not the music. The music is when the music sounds. It's the same with the scripture. The book of the Bible is not really the scripture. Those are the notes. Scripture becomes the living word of God when it's proclaimed here in this church. And then when it's proclaimed here in this church, what's happening in the church, that's the title of the book, What Happens at Mass, what's happening in the church is that event that, that the scriptural text is speaking of in the past becomes here and now the event of this community, hearing God's word. Don't have time to go into the details, but <clears throat> we always move from the Old Testament text, there's, a, there's a, a short pause, and then the assembly sings a psalm. The psalm response is this assembly, you, using the inspired words of the psalm, which are the, the Spirit's words, using uh, that for us to respond to God's word. God has spoken to us. We praise him, we thank him, we continue our prayer. But that psalm prayer is us making the music. The scriptural text comes alive here. I'm gonna get ahead of the game just for a minute so you can see how alive the scriptural text becomes. It's going to become the body and blood of Christ on the altar eventually, but like I said, I got ahead of the game there. But that's where it's going, all right? But it starts with the word. And then we move <clears throat> to a, a passage from the Apostle. Passage from the Apostle is always some deep theological insight, uh, very often speaking to us uh, uh, with, with uh, citations from the Old Testament. St. Paul often is citing an Old Testament text to show how it's relevant in Christ. But the liturgy of the word, or let's say the music of the word sounding in the assembly on Sunday, climaxes in the gospel because <clears throat> the gospel is the climax of the scriptures. The gospels tell the story of Christ and the gospels have their own climax. Each of the four gospels <clears throat> is, if you will, a long introduction to the climax of recounting the story of Jesus's death and resurrection. And what, so when we read any part of the gospel, it's so that we will remember the climax and understand the climax from one point or the other. So <clears throat> with any reading of the gospel, uh, the, the whole story is present. We don't have time to read the whole story, but the whole story is meant to be present and you know the whole story. 
The most vivid example of everything I'm talking about is the Easter Vigil, when we have seven long readings from the Old Testament, which are meant to, as it were, summarize the Old Testament. And then the climax of the, of, of the Liturgy of the Word is the reading of the, the account of resurrection from Matthew, Mark, or Luke. <clears throat> That's the music sounding here when it's read. That event of Jesus' death and resurrection is God's deed. And God's deed never grows old. God's deed never passes away. God's deed is rendered present by the proclamation of God's word, which I said has the power of the Holy Spirit in it. So what happens at Mass when the gospel is read? That is our stepping into the never passing away event of Jesus' death and resurrection. Every liturgy of the word has this dynamic pattern in it. Drives us to the gospel, drives us to an encounter with the events of the past, which become a present event in the assembly where that story is proclaimed. That's the music of God's word. God is speaking. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. We, pray, we say, we're talking to him. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, because he's present. And you're expressing that with your faith. But <clears throat> the word proclaimed, as it were, becomes more and more flesh. The word proclaimed is meant to move in the church, is meant to move in us in such a way that it elicits a response from us. A response from us, which, we, which is a response of wanting to give thanks and praise to God the Father for the gift of his Son come to us in the flesh, for the gift of his Son crucified and risen from the dead and breathing out the Holy Spirit on us. You, you, can, you see, the way I'm talking here, I'm just summarizing the scriptures. You know that already. I'm just reminding you of how it works. So this, is, this is the center of it all. But so the assembly wants to respond. It wants to worship God. And it, and it knows how to do that because the Lord himself gave us a command. Do this in memory of me. And so the, the second of the four parts of the Mass that I want to, to look at with you now is the significance of bringing forward in procession gifts of bread and wine and money. What does that mean? What are, what are we all trying to say by acting that way? Because this is the assembly's response to having heard the word of God. The Lord said, do this in memory of me. But we can wonder, it's what was, what was in the mind of God? What was the plan of God when he, when he gave himself to us through Jesus under the form of bread and wine? Bread and wine, of course, have their significance inside the Passover meal at the Last Supper. Uh, they, they speak the story, the Passover meal, which is, which is Jesus' Last Supper. The, the Passover meal speaks the whole story of Israel's exodus from Egypt. But there's more meaning to bread and wine than just its meaning inside the Passover meal. Uh, the texts of the liturgy say it itself, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. These, these signs, bread and wine, I, like, I, I put it this way, these are not uh, purely natural symbols. What do I mean by that? Water is a purely natural symbol. God makes water. Okay, um, apples are a purely natural symbol. God makes apples. The sun is a symbol. God makes the sun. God makes darkness. All those are symbols that the liturgy uses. But God doesn't make bread and wine. 
human beings do. And that's some of its significance. Right? We couldn't do it without God. I know that. Uh, you got, you got to have wheat. You got to have sun. You got to have dirt. You got to have time. Uh, you got to have grapes. You have to know what to do with them. But this is, this is, this is human beings and God making something together. And it's actually what we do all the time. We make food. Uh, there's a lot of other animals on earth other than human beings. Uh, mammals, let's just go for the mammals, all right? The mammals have to eat. But we're the only mammals that prepare our food together, work it over, put it on fire, wait for something to mature, all, all that stuff. It's, our, it's a food shared is human existence. The world has to stay alive by eating. And so, in some sense, the whole of our work and existence is embedded in these two basic kinds of food. Bread, the staff of life, and wine. Not needed, but making life extra something special. Those are the two kinds of signs. Fruit of the earth and work of human hands. And these are the, these are the parts of the meal that Jesus himself used uh, to give his disciples the night before he died a sign in which he embedded a meaning inexhaustible in, in what is hidden in the signs of bread and wine. You know the story of the supper. We, we say it in the course of the Eucharistic prayer in a stylized way. On the night before he died, Jesus took bread in his sacred hands and with eyes raised to heaven, giving thanks to his Father, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body. Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood. Do this in memory of me. What Jesus was doing at, the, at that Last Supper, historically speaking, was giving to his disciples a sign that would help them to penetrate something that would, that in fact, was meaningless to them while it happened, namely his death on the cross. The disciples went into huge crisis as Jesus dies on the cross. And yet, by the repetition of this sign in obedience to him, little by little, his community of disciples, from that time down to our time, we are descendants of that community, from that time down to our time, realize that this is a sign by which we can understand that the death of Jesus is life-giving for us. The shedding of Jesus' blood affects for us the forgiveness of our sins and establishes us in a new and everlasting covenant with God. All of that, Jesus embeds, as it were, in the signs of bread and wine. Not arbitrarily in bread and wine, but on purpose with bread and wine, because bread and wine is fruit of the earth and work of human hands. So, back to you, bringing forward bread and wine. I know you don't all do it, but you're, two or three people are carrying it, right? But they're carrying it in the name of all the baptized in the assembly. And you need to watch it and be aware of that. And somebody's carrying money. People say, well, you know, money, money's dirty. That, that's not churchy. Money isn't dirty. Money is your lives. Money is hours of your lives. Given for the work of the church. 
So what's coming forward and being placed in the hands of the priest? The priest who represents Christ at the head of the community. What's coming forward? You are. And in placing the bread and wine in the hands of the priest, you are implicitly making a request of Jesus, represented in the priest. You are saying, with your lives, do something with this. Make our bread and wine. Make our lives say what you said in your dying on the cross. Make our lives say your same sacrifice. And where did we get the idea to, to propose something as bold as that? From him. Do this in memory of me, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries, as one of the prayers says. Okay, so um, I really want you to understand, it, the moment is simple, but it's, it's, it's a profound coming forward of you yourselves. And you yourselves will be taken by your pastor, your priest, and very simply, he just places the gifts on the altar. Blessed are you, Lord our God, for from your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become, now we're looking forward to the third part of the Mass I want to talk about, it will become for us the bread of life. It will become for us our, the drink of our salvation. It will become for us spiritual drink. With that said, we come to the third part of the Mass. But what I'm stressing here for the rest of the Mass is I want you, if you want to keep on understanding Mass ever more deeply, we want to keep our eyes on the bread and the wine. We want to listen to the words around the bread and the wine and all the action around the bread and the wine because you know our Catholic faith. In the course of the Eucharistic prayer, and it takes about three minutes, so pay attention, goes by fast. In the course of the Eucharistic prayer, our gifts of bread and wine will be transformed into the body and blood of Christ. We said, do something with this. Make it say what you said with your life. He says, okay, I will. I do. What happens at Mass? That does. But it's not just somehow or other Jesus is present on the altar. Somehow or other. No, not somehow or other. Because you brought your lives. Because you brought bread and wine. Jesus takes it and assumes it and makes it his own. And not makes it his own in just any shape. He makes it his own sacrifice of offering himself on the cross to the Father. Difference being, now we are with him in the offering. This is what is affected by, at Mass. So, we come now to the third part of the Mass I want you to look at, which is called the Eucharistic Prayer. And uh, I like very much how uh, the preparation of the gifts finishes. After the gifts are placed on the altar, uh, the priest will say to the assembly, pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. I, I like that phrase, my sacrifice and yours. Uh, it's, it's Christ, as it were, saying, my sacrifice is yours. Uh, in Latin, Latin has a nice little nuance. You know, other languages have little words. There's, got, there's two words for Latin in, uh, for, there's two words for and in Latin. One is et and the other is ac. Uh, and the word in this prayer in, in the original Latin is ac. Meum ac vestrum sacramentum. And ac will take the, the and word and throw the weight on the second word that's coming. So it's like Christ is saying, pray, 
that my sacrifice, and indeed yours too, may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. So that we're all subsumed into his sacrifice. And then you all stand and say, may the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands. Beautiful moment. Enjoy it, mean it, stand up and say it. But then we're on our feet. And then the priest uh, starts the Eucharistic prayer with this beautiful dialogue. The Lord be with you. And you can say, why is he saying that again? This is the third time. Didn't he think he'd be God it the first time? <laughs> now, every time the, the priest says, the Lord be with you, it's a little liturgical sign. A new section is beginning. Get ready. The Lord be with you is the priest saying, you're baptized. Wake up. And you say, and with your spirit. And that's like saying, well, you're the priest. Be the priest. Okay? Two roles, all right? And then he says, all right, I will be the priest. Lift up your hearts. And you say, well, we've already done that. Okay? <laughs> All right. We have lifted them up to the Lord. Then the priest says, now we can do business. Then let us give thanks to the Lord our God. You know that the word thanks in Greek is Eucharist. Let us do the Eucharist now. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Um. I'm going to read to you um, a page from what is co uh, called, the, it's kind of a, a dull title for a beautiful piece of, of church teaching. Uh, every liturgical book has, at the beginning of it, what is called the general instruction. And um, there, there, there's, a, there's a general instruction of the Roman Missal, which is actually official church teaching with the force of canon law at the beginning of that big red book that we pray out, you, you read the first 60 pages is the church's official theology of every part of the mass and how it's to be understood. You can read it if you want. It's actually beautiful. Uh, seminarians and priests read it and learn it and, and, it, and it's wonderful. But I'm just going to read you uh, what it says about the parts of the Eucharistic prayer. I can remember years ago when I used to celebrate Sunday mass uh, sometimes it in the Silverton Parish. And uh, I did that for a number of years, every other Sunday. And I can remember a little girl once telling me, I was trying to teach her a little bit about the Mass, and she said, uh, I was going to go into the Eucharistic prayer, and she says, oh, that's that long prayer that the priest just prays. And I said, no, honey, it isn't just the long prayer that the priest should pray. But I think that we kind of experience it that way. Um, let me read you what, uh, what the documents say, and let's see if we can't go there together, if you're not already there already. It says, now the center and high point of the entire celebration begins, namely the Eucharistic prayer itself, that is the prayer of thanksgiving and sanctification. The priest calls upon the people to lift up their hearts toward the Lord in prayer and thanksgiving, and he associates the people with himself in the prayer that he addresses in the name of the entire community to God the Father through Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit. I know it's a long sentence, but let's just recover that. It, it'll, it should be easy for you to remember because you've been at Mass hundreds of times. The priest associates the people with the prayer. You must be aware that you are praying this prayer as the assembly as much as the priest is. We'll, we'll explain how in a minute. But uh, it's a prayer that he addresses, the priest addresses, in the name of the whole community. Because the priest is, is saying again and again throughout the prayer, we, he's speaking about all of us, huh? And this, this is Christ at the head of the community saying we. What an honor this is, huh? What an honor this is. And then um, furthermore, the meaning of this prayer is that the whole congregation of the faithful joins with Christ. Did you hear? I'm not, I'm not done with the sentence, but the meaning of this prayer is that the whole congregation of the faithful joins with Christ 
in confessing the great deeds of God and in the offering of the sacrifice. The priest does not offer the sacrifice alone. The whole assembly is offering it together with the priest. It will, it will, it will repeat as we go along. But it says, for this reason, the Eucharistic prayer requires that everybody listens to it with reverence and in silence. Listening is active participation. It's not just the prayer, the long prayer that the priest prays. Listen and follow it with intention, reverence and silence. This takes effort, not too much, but some. Then it says the main elements of the Eucharistic prayer can be distinguished from one another in this way. And there are eight. You don't have to remember them, but you can watch them go by as you listen to the prayer. And I just think hearing them articulated can help you understand what they are. The first, thanksgiving, expressed especially in the preface, in which the priest, in the name of the whole of the holy people, glorifies God the Father and gives thanks to him for the whole work. It always begins the same way. Uh, we, the preface dialogue, which is where the prayer begins, let us give thanks to the Lord our God, and you all respond, it is right to give him thanks and praise. And then actually the priest starts from that moment on, not speaking back and forth anymore, but is speaking to God the Father in the name of the whole community. But the first thing he says is he actually he grabs the words right out of your mouth. You said it is right to give him thanks and praise. The priest says, Father, it is truly right to give you thanks and praise, always and everywhere to give you thanks through Jesus Christ our Lord. So thanksgiving uh, is one of the dimensions and the Eucharistic prayer always begins with this thanksgiving of the preface and in the middle of the preface, the reason for our thanksgiving, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, for you, and then it, it, there, there's 90 prefaces, all right, which is called richness, okay? The church is rich in prayer, okay? It's a treasury of prayer. Uh, so 90 prefaces, 90 different ways of saying, we thank you for this. But it always concludes in the same way, it concludes in the same way, and so we ask you to join our voices with the voices of angels in heaven who are constantly singing, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of hosts. That's the second part, the acclamation or the sanctus by which the whole congregation, joining with the heavenly powers, sings the Holy, Holy, Holy. Listen to this underlined part. This acclamation, which constitutes part of the Eucharistic prayer itself, is pronounced by all the people with the priest. So this is, this is all the people are saying this part of the Eucharistic prayer with the priest. You need to be aware that the, that the Sanctus or the Holy Holy is part of the Eucharistic prayer. I think we tend not to be aware of that because after the Sanctus, uh, we change gestures. From standing, we kneel, and then the priest begins a different dimension of the prayer. And in, in that different dimension, it sort of seems, well, now he's, he's, he's off to the races, you know, he's, now he's beginning. But he's not beginning. We're already, we've already begun with the preface. We're already deep into it with the Holy Holy, and he continues then with the next part of the Mass. And the next part of the Mass, uh, use a, a big Greek word that the, that the tradition uses. It's called the epiclesis, which is a Greek word uh, that we use for the invocation of the Holy Spirit. But that's the next part of the Mass where the priest extends his hands over the gifts 
and with some form of language or other, begs the Father to send the Holy Spirit on these gifts for their transformation. Let me just read one example for you. Um, you're, you're familiar with it, but the language is really wonderful, and the gesture um, that is, in, you want to watch this. I said, watch the bread and wine, watch the gestures over the, the bread and wine, pay attention to the words. So the priest suddenly extends his hands over the bread and wine and says, therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you by the same spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. It's an elegant way of saying, it was his idea, so do it. Okay, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. You think it's not going to happen? What happens at Mass? The Holy Spirit will do with the bread and wine that you brought forward, which is to say, your lives. The Holy Spirit will form from that material the same thing that he did in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He formed a body for the eternal Son. He formed the whole life of Christ such that everything of the life of Christ could say who the Father is, who God is. The Holy Spirit formed that. The Holy Spirit formed the cruel crucifixion of Jesus into a life-giving moment of salvation for us. The Holy Spirit raised the dead body of Jesus from the dead, such that the risen body of Jesus could breathe out the Holy Spirit. That same Spirit is on our altar now, transforming the gifts of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. This is huge, unbelievable. All this hidden in the command, do this in memory of me. It says in the technical language of the general instruction, implores the power of the Holy Spirit that the gifts offered by human hands be consecrated and become Christ's body and blood. And then it goes on to say, and there's another part of the prayer that does this, and it prays that the unblemished sacrificial victim to be consumed in communion may be for the salvation of those who partake of it. I'll come to that prayer in a minute. But the next part of the Mass, a, a real high point, of course, is the institution narrative, where the priest then takes up first the bread and recalls the story of Jesus' Last Supper. And the very words of Jesus, he says them in the present tense, take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. And you know the faith of the church. It is your faith, too, that the action of the Holy Spirit and the words of Jesus effect the transformation of bread and wine. Your lives, it's not bread and wine from the sacristy, it's your lives, you intended it. Your lives are transformed and the bread and wine are transformed. And then in another part of the Mass, uh, immediately after the bread and wine are transformed into the body and blood of Christ, uh, the prayer is a memory before God the Father that says, therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of your saving passion, of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven. As we remember those past deeds, which I've been saying is somehow present now because it's God's deed and God's deed does not slip into the past. As we remember, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. What is the church doing in that moment of the prayer? What are you doing together with Christ at that moment in the prayer? 
you are offering his same sacrifice to God the Father. And the Father looks on this assembly and sees you joined to his Son in his perfect offering, in his perfect worship. And you get credit for it for eternity unless you step out of it. Don't step out of it. Stay in. This sacrifice is so big that while we're there, we pray for our own transformation, looking forward. We know, we know where the rest of this ceremony is going to go. Eventually, after this is offered up, we shall eat and drink from the altar, which is, the, which is what happens in any ancient ritual of sacrifice. First, something is offered, and then a part of what is offered is eaten or drunk, which is a sign that I am the sacrifice. We are what is offered. And our communion will say this. Listen how the prayer looks forward to, the, to that. Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church. Now Christ's body and blood remembered are called the oblation of the church. You are the church. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your son which is coming in five minutes, grant that we who are nourished by that may be filled with his Holy Spirit and that we may become one body, one spirit in Christ. This is what happens at Mass. The church becomes body of Christ, one body, one spirit in Christ. While we're here, we pray for everyone and everything. The living and the dead, we remember the saints in heaven. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your church on earth. May this sacrifice bring salvation to the whole world. Everybody, everywhere, is remembered and lifted up. And finally, the climax of this prayer, the beautiful climax of this prayer is the body and blood of the Lord. Remember where they came from. You brought them down the altar, have been transformed. The body and blood of the Lord are, as it were, held up to God the Father. And, and we just say to God, it's, it's as a, in, in some sense, the whole world is being held up to God the Father. The whole world is being held up, transformed into the body and blood of Christ. And we say, what's happening here? through Christ and with Christ and in Christ to you, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor forever and ever. And then from the assembly, your amen to all that. You're saying, I believe it, I want it, I intend to be there. That is my prayer too. This is what happens at Mass, and once that has been achieved, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a divine achievement. This is God's work. This is God's work. We, this is nothing that we could produce. And yet God makes it in cooperation with us so that we, it really is we who are doing it together with God. And then we have communion. And the communion rite uh, has a number of parts to it also. It begins with the Lord's Prayer, Our Father. And that already is communion because, you know, you sort of think, well, you know, that's a nice prayer. Jesus taught it to us. We should throw that in somewhere. Uh, no, it's like this is, this is its original place, by which I mean... This sacrifice of Christ, which is present now, 
on the altar, the sacrifice of Christ is present on the altar, has purchased for us adoption into the Son's place in the Trinity, such that we can dare to call his Father our Father. It's incredible. Because what the Son, through his whole life, has revealed to us is that the one God, in the one God there is a mysteriously more than one. In the one God there is a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect communion and movement with each other. This is, the, this is a movement into which we have been taken such that we can say to the source from which Jesus and the Spirit themselves come, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is, this is communion, to be able to t talk to God on such intimate terms, to speak to him in the very words that Jesus, in a sense from all eternity, said, but from all eternity, you know, he didn't have human words. But when he becomes incarnate, he has human words and says the same love for the Father that he has said from all eternity. But now in human words, which he's purchased for us to say by his sacrifice, we say it. That's communion. Communion is being able to say by rights, Father to God. And then to ask the Father for everything. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Save us from the evil one. For we are still here in this world. That's communion. Communion is also receiving peace from Christ our Lord. Peace I give you. My peace is my gift to you. And give it to one another. Peace be with you. Offer each other the peace. This is communion too. It's communion reminding us that yes, we are about to receive the body and blood of the Lord, which is meant to be intensely personal. And it unites us, each of us, with God in an intensely personal way. But at the same time, we cannot be united with Christ without being in communion with one another. He wants it that way. He has set it up that way. I go to Christ together with you, which is what he wants me to know. He wants me to have his love for you and you to have his love for me. That's not an effort of our will that's the gift given. That's achieved by God. And we blaspheme the gift if we break communion and peace with one another. Finally, for the climax, we come forward and receive the gift. We, we swallow what's on the altar which is to say everything that the Eucharistic prayer means. And I just, I rush through it, I know, but you're gonna come to Mass Sunday after Sunday. Keep drilling down, huh? Uh, look at those prayers in, in a, in a Magnificat or a Missalette before. Read those Eucharistic prayers in advance. Prepare yourself. Take, take the language seriously, but, uh, but, what we see then, if I say if we swallow what's on the altar, then we become the sacrifice. Our lives do. Our lives become the offering. Our lives become the pleading for the world's salvation and peace. And finally, after communion, the communion rite itself closes with the post-communion prayer and an amen. And then the priest says it all over again, the Lord be with you. And that just, there he goes, saying it again. <laughs> but that's a sign that communion's over and the last part is beginning. And the last part is a quick little part, but it's a very important part. 
It's called, it's, it, it, just somehow it doesn't come off well in English, but it's called the dismissal or the sending. Uh, but we sort of experience this like it, it's over, you can go home now. But this is not what's happening. Uh, this is, uh, it's a being sent. It's, it's the church's being sent. I can use the words that Jesus uses uh, on, on the, the evening of the resurrection with the disciples. He breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he says, as the Father has sent me into the world, so I send you into the world. This is what's happening into the church. As the Son was sent by the Father into the world, now the Son sends us into the world. Into the world. Back to your lives. No big deal. I mean, but back to your lives renewed, empowered with charity, empowered to love. And there is no greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one another. How can people love that way? Only at the fountain of the Eucharist. But I'm, I'm urging on you to see how big is the gift. It's enormous and it's, it's limitless in its power if we but attend to it and, and take it seriously. I want to just wrap around once uh, and come back to the institution narrative and the meaning of the Last Supper. You know, it's good old-fashioned Catholic theology, and you know it too, that we say uh, that the sacrifice of Calvary is present on the altar at every Mass. You know that. That's one of the ways of putting it. But how is it present on the altar? Uh, because we're, we're not enacting a crucifixion on the altar. So how is it present? It's present by means of the signs of bread and wine, which in the supper, the night before he died, Jesus took the signs of bread and wine and pointed in a very profound way to what his death on the cross would mean. I said it already. His death on the cross, for him is death, but nourishment and life for us. His death on the cross is his blood poured out to the last drop, but for us, the forgiveness of sins and a new covenant with God, everlasting. And so now, in the original historical unfolding of events, the events were the supper, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and then the supper remembered, the supper remembered, the supper remembered from one generation to the next, the supper remembered. The supper remembered is the way in which the church realized both that Christ is risen and that Christ risen means not that the sacrifice can be forgotten about, it means that the sac Christ's being risen renders him present in the shape of sacrifice. That's how Calvary can be present on the altar. The one who is risen is in this constant condition, not of suffering, but in his, his whole being, his whole body and blood is offered always. We talk about him continually interceding for us with the Father. His, his continual intercession is his risen condition. And so the way we realize that Christ is risen is by remembering his supper, which proclaims his death. I'll summarize it all in a phrase you know. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim 
proclaim. That's a joyful word. We proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes again. He comes again because he is risen and is always coming to the church. So that's a refresher course on the Eucharist. Dear friends, God bless you all and good night. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Abba Jeremy. We are so appreciative to, to have you with us. Um, I know I'll be thinking a little deeper about what I'm doing at Mass for the next few weeks, and I hope you will too. Um, <clears throat> We'd like to receive your blessing, so why don't you begin with that wonderful phrase you love so much. The Lord be with you? Yeah, yeah. Sure. all right. <laughs> I can give you the, the, what is the privilege of an abbot, um, uh, a pontifical blessing. Uh, I know you know the answer to the Lord be with you. Uh, then the pontifical blessings next line is, blessed be the name of the Lord now and forever you know that one blessed be the name of the lord now and forever is your line our help is in the name of the lord who made heaven and earth okay so stand the lord be with you blessed be the name of the lord now and forever our help is in the name of the lord who made heaven and earth May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace.